saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you today. I hope everybody's doing fantastic. We've just studied the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. And so far we've seen the creation of Jewish believers, also known as the little flock, which isn't so little by this time. There's tens of thousands of believers, all the Jewish believers under Peter and the remaining 11 apostles. We've seen how God gives the apostles power from on high, the Holy Spirit, performing signs and miracles and wonders and healing the sick, curing the diseases and so on. And God gives Israel one last chance by extending his mercy for an extra year after the ascension of Jesus. And we saw how this extension was explained in a parable of the fig tree back in the book of Luke. Now this year extension has gone by, but we're still within the first year. It's time for the nation of Israel to make a decision. Either they obey the Holy Spirit or they deny the Holy Spirit speaking through the prophet Stephen. And what did they do? They denied the Holy Spirit once again for the last time by killing Stephen and the game is over. Israel has finally fallen, has fallen. And we're introduced for the first time this educated Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a law-minded Jew named Saul of Tarsus. So that's a very general, a very basic overview of the first seven chapters of Acts. And if you don't mind, I'd like to go over two things before we start our study on Acts chapter 8. First thing, remember in the last video in chapter 7, Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father. He wasn't sitting, he was standing. And this is very significant. And because the video was already right about 30 minutes, uh, I didn't have time to continue explaining in detail why he was standing. I didn't have a chance to show you the scriptures explaining why he was not sitting but standing. And the fact that he's standing is very significant and it's not something that we should skip over. This needs to be studied out respectfully. Now a great brother and friend, a dear saint, Brother Frank, took the time to post all the scripture regarding the reasons why Jesus was standing. And I'd like to say thank you, Brother Frank. You're a true saint in Christ Jesus, and I love you very much, brother. Let's go over some of the scripture that Brother Frank shared with the group. It explains why Stephen saw Jesus standing instead of sitting, just before Stephen was killed by being stoned to death. In Isaiah 14, the Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. Again, Isaiah 2, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. That's speaking of the day of the Lord, Daniel 70th week. In Psalm 7, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger, lift up thy, thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. Psalm 9, Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail, let the heathen be judged in thy sight. In Revelation 5, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. In Acts 7, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. In Hebrews 10, But this man who is Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Notice here that ever since the stoning of Stephen and the revelation of the mystery to our Apostle Paul, Jesus has been sitting ever since, sitting at the right side of the Father, and he will rise once again. First, he stands up, he comes down to the edge of heaven and earth, and catches up the body of Christ, the harpazo, the rapture. Then, the day of the Lord begins. 
the first seven years. We know this is Daniel's 70th week, going back to the kingdom gospel to reconcile with the nation of Israel once again. God's grace giving them yet another opportunity to repent, be baptized for the remission of sins, and endure to the end. And the second thing I want to touch on before we get into our study on Acts chapter 8 is the word dispensation. I've already shown you that the King James Version Bible uses the word dispensation four times, specifically in Paul's books. And every single time the word dispensation is used, all four times that it's used, it's the same Greek word oikonomia. Now oikonomia means, this is the definition of it, the management of a household or household affairs. The management, oversight, administration of others' property. The office of a manager or overseer, a stewardship. Administration, a dispensing of rules, a dispensation. So why would the enemy remove this word dispensation from all the new versions of the Bible? Well, usually when the enemy removes something from God's word, it's something very important and we need to pay attention, special attention. Also, the enemy will twist and corrupt words trying to change the definition or trying to make the word itself seem like a dirty word or a profanity of sorts. For example, there are people today who know absolutely nothing about right division or dispensations. And you have to know right division in order to understand what dispensations are. And because of their ignorance, they come up with words that have nothing to do with anything. For example, the words hypo dispensation or hyper dispensations. Both phrases are used as dirty words to make right division look like it's something bad. This comes straight from the pit of hell. And let me explain the true meaning behind these words. First of all, the word hypo dispensational, the fact is 99.9% .9 of Christendom is hypo dispensational without even realizing it. What does it mean to be hypo dispensational? Hypo dispensationalists are those who believe the body of Christ was created at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now, for those of you who have been studying with us so far from Acts 1 to Acts 7, you know for a fact that the body of Christ wasn't started at Pentecost. In fact, the body of Christ is created with Paul in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus when Jesus stops him and changes his life. You also know that this little group of believers in Acts chapter 2 are all Jews, the apostles, who received power from the Holy Spirit that day on a Jewish feast day to preach to the Jews only. They were preaching the kingdom gospel, not the gospel of grace. That's why we need to rightly divide. So the majority of denominations who teach that the body of Christ started at Pentecost obviously doesn't know anything about right division and they fall under the phrase of hypo dispensationalists. Now what about hyper dispensationalists? Those people go overboard. They teach that the body of Christ was created at the end of the book of Acts, somewhere around Acts 28, at the end of Paul's ministry. It doesn't make sense. Somehow they miss the fact that Jesus told Paul in Acts chapter 9 that he would be the first to preach to the Gentiles a new gospel, the mystery, the secret, the building of the body of Christ. So we've seen what hypo dispensationalists are. I've shown you what hyper dispensationalists are. Now what are we? Where do we fall in this group? We, those of us who rightly divide accordingly, know that the body of Christ was, at, was created with Paul on the road to Damascus and the actual creation of the mystery, the body of Christ, the gospel of grace. It falls in the middle chapters between chapter 1 and chapter 28. You can think of it as mid-Acts, right division. So those of us who use the King James Version Bible who rightly divide and know where and when Jesus revealed the mystery to the Apostle Paul are simply right division dispensationalists. Not hypo, not hyper. We fall in the middle where God's word itself indicates where the nation of Israel fell and the body of Christ was born. It's that simple. Now that you know a little bit about these terms of hypo and hyper, 
you'll be able to see the ignorance of people when they throw around these terms actually not knowing a single thing about what they're talking about and you'll also know that they have no clue what right division is and there's a lot of people like that around today the enemy is working through his people to fight the truth of God's word rightly divided this is a spiritual war it's a supernatural war but we know who wins at the end all right I had to cover those two things because they're important subjects why Jesus was standing in the ex and exposing the enemy's tactics to destroy the truth of God's Word rightly divided so with the time we have remaining I'm gonna try really hard to make each of these videos close to 30 minutes and not too far past that and believe me it's not easy to do especially when there's so much information that we have to cover in order to understand what's going on so if I need to make part two for chapter 8 then that's what I'm gonna do and we'll have to wait and see in Acts chapter 8 starting in verse 1 and Saul was consenting unto his death his being Stephen and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the Apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. A couple things we see again this great persecution against the church and we know that the word church here is the Greek word ekklesia which simply means an assembly of believers. This isn't the body of Christ here okay it's the little flock believing Jews in the kingdom gospel. Also we see that they were scattered throughout the region this is the same group of people that James was writing to in the book of James. In James 1, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Diverse temptations, the deception caused by the Antichrist, and the trying of your faith. Again, these things will take place during the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. James is writing to the little flock of Jews here in the last days, going into the day of the Lord. Now keep in mind, there's a transition taking place here. This is before the mystery is revealed to Paul. They all think that they're heading into Daniel's 70th week. In verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Again, church here being assembly, not the body of Christ. This is the little flock entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Now we're still seeing the power of the Holy Ghost presenting itself through the apostles here. Once again, we're still looking at the kingdom gospel. And Philip, being one of them, able to perform signs and wonders, convincing the Jews that Jesus was indeed, in fact, their Messiah. Verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God, and to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So what kind of baptism are we looking at here? This is the water baptism, the kingdom gospel. Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins, and endure to the end. Verse 13, Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, and they might receive the Holy Ghost. It's important to notice here that all these people who were water baptized did not 
have the Holy Spirit. They were just performing a ritual which separated the believers and the unbelievers. That's what water baptism was used for, to separate believers and unbelievers, to separate the sheep from the goat. Next verse. For as yet he, the Holy Ghost, was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, they were just baptized with water. None of them had the Holy Ghost yet. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So we see here two different types of baptism. One with water, and another by the Holy Ghost. Two distinctly different types of baptism. One is a ritual, the other is the earnest, the seal, the down payment, the promise of your position in the body of Christ. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So this magician Simon offers Peter some money to buy the Holy Ghost's power, paying someone to receive spiritual rewards. The practice of paying for spiritual rewards or positions, there's a word for it, and the word comes from this Simon here in Acts 8. The word is simony, and you can see that it derives from the name Simon. Simony is a noun, and it is people who wish to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. The crime of buying or selling ecclesiastical preferment, or the corrupt presentation of anyone to the ecclesiastical benefice, or money or reward okay and verse 25 and they when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans now we're introduced to the Samaritans who are they three things about the Samaritans to keep it simple number one obviously they're from Samaria number two they were heavily involved with idolatry worshiping false gods and so on and the third thing, they were looked down upon by the Jews. The Jews wanted nothing to do with the Samaritans. Okay? Normally, the Jews would avoid talking to them or even having eye contact with them. Look at the verse here in John. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me a drink. For his disciples were gone away in, unto the city to buy meat. To buy food. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, unto Jesus, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Okay, now moving on to our study, next verse, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, Gaza is just south of Jerusalem. If you look at the map in front of you and you notice where Jerusalem is in the bottom right corner and you look further down uh, southwest, you see Gaza. Okay, it's mostly desert and a highway passed through this region for those traveling from the south coming up through Jerusalem to worship and even take part in the Jewish feasts. Verse 27, And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, 
and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now the elephant in the room here is what is a eunuch? Well, without going in too much detail because we're running out of time, number one, a eunuch is a castrated male. Yes, that means his privates have been cut off. Now why would they do that, you ask? Because they're idiots. No, seriously. The practice of eunuchism was used to ensure that the specific man would be loyal to their queen without having the interference of lusts for other women in the picture. It was a way to completely isolate the servant from the world and ensure complete submission and loyalty to a certain ruler or a queen or an organization even. I think we all get the picture. Now one thing that I did find humorous while studying on this subject of eunuch, it said that even today there are some eunuchs in Rome who are employed in singing soprano in the Sistine Chapel. So that's where the saying comes from. I learn something new every day. Continuing on. Now this eunuch was returning and sitting in his chariot and he read Isaiah, the prophet, the book of Isaiah. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, the eunuch said back, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare this generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Now one thing here, it's interesting that the Jews today avoid chapter 53 in the book of Isaiah. They avoid teaching this chapter today in their synagogues. And if you read that chapter, Isaiah 53, for homework, you'll notice that it's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about his birth, his ministry, and his crucifixion. It's all about Jesus. No wonder why they ignore this chapter. That's because they deny Jesus as their Messiah, and they choose to turn a blind eye to the proof. In verse 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet, uh, whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the time at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now notice in verse 37, If thou believest with all thine heart, thy mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is that different from Paul's gospel that we're saved under today? We believe and know for a fact that Jesus is and was God in the flesh. He died, was buried, and rose again the third day. But here, the eunuch doesn't know anything about the death, burial, and resurrection. He just says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, a different gospel here. That's the kingdom gospel. It's not for us today. Now, why was this eunuch baptized with water? Well, first, this is before the revelation of the mystery to Paul, before the creation of the body of Christ. Second, this eunuch was worshiping the Jewish religion. He was considered a proselyte, going up to Jerusalem to take part in Jewish feast days. That's why he was there. Not sure how he, he would have been circumcised, though. Well, I guess maybe he was really, really circumcised, come to think of it. And third, lastly, Philip was in the little flock, the kingdom gospel, their gospel. Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins and endure till the end. Verse 39, and when they came and when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, 
and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities, till he came to Caesarea. Now, looking back at verse 39, we see this phrase, caught away. The Lord caught away Philip. The Greek word here is the same word for rapture. We see it here in verse 39. The word is harpazo. He was caught away, snatched away by force. One minute he was with the eunuch, and the very next moment Philip found himself miles and miles and miles away in another location. This happened supernaturally. We see an example of what the rapture is here. It's pretty interesting. Okay, so let's review. We learned why Jesus was standing instead of sitting. We learned the difference between hypo dispensationalism and hyper dispensationalism. Just another tactic to discredit those of us who rightly divide and actually understand what God's word says. It's all about jealousy and pride, my friends. And we saw what Paul, what, what Saul played in uh, killing Stephen, the fall of Israel after a year's extension. And we learned who the Samaritans were. The Samarians, the, the, the meaning of the word simony, deriving from Simon the magician trying to buy the Holy Spirit. And once again, all we see is the kingdom gospel before Paul's conversion, prior to the creation of the body of Christ. We investigated what a eunuch is and the fact that they, they make great soprano singers uh, in the opera. And finally, we saw the rapture being used on Philip taking him over miles and miles away in a flash of a second. Next, we'll be getting into chapter 9, and we're going to see the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. Till then, peace, grace, love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you on the next study.